So this is an iPhone 8 that does not power on, and in today's video, we're gonna walk through how to diagnose it and how to repair it. So the backstory to this phone is that it had a battery replacement, and it actually worked fine for about a month, and then just out of nowhere, it died. So they took it to another repair shop to take a look at it. They tried a new battery, a new charging port, a new screen, and there's just no signs of life out of this. It is just fully dead. So it's now here at our repair shop where we specialize in motherboard repairs and data recovery, and we're gonna go through the process on how to diagnose and repair and recover the data from this phone. So if you need your iPhone or iPad repaired, reach out to me through my website, which I will link down below. We can send you a quote for a mail-in service for these type of repairs. So let's go ahead and get started with this tutorial. So one of the first things you wanna do when diagnosing a phone that does not power on or does not charge is use a USB meter. I will link to this meter, which is one of my favorites, down below in the video description, which you can buy on Amazon. The things you wanna look at is the amps, the current. So you can see we're getting 0 0.007 amps. The fourth number doesn't really matter. I just focus on the first three. You can actually see it's jumping around, but it's mostly at 007. And that indicates that there's an issue. Uh, a working phone should give you at least one app, if not two. So we're way below a working threshold for a phone. So next thing we wanna do is, if you have one, is use a TriStar tester. This allows us to scan the basically the charging circuit of the phone to see if maybe that's the issue. Now, we're assuming that we haven't opened the phone yet and we're just doing external testing without this assembly. So if we run this test, we can see uh, the charging port section pass and the charging IC section pass. So, so far it seems like there's no issues with the charging circuit, but there's no power. And this meter tells us that it's not charging, but it's not because the charging circuit is bad, because there's probably some other issue. So now it's actually time to get into the motherboard to see what's going on. So let's go ahead and get this board out of the housing. I like to just completely isolate the board from the parts because you never know any of these parts could be part of the problem. So let's go ahead and pop all this cables out. Alrighty, so now we have just the motherboard. I've actually already taken off these stickers just to do a visual inspection. So now we're gonna use the DT880. This is a mini DC power supply that has interchangeable plugs for the different iPhone models, which I will also link down below. I use this every single day and I love it. It just so compact, uh, like I said, it has interchangeable plugs. So you only have one cable that you just swap out just these plugs and then you don't have a mess of different cables like some of the other uh, you know, squids that they sell for these type of issues or these type of diagnosing. So what we're gonna do is actually plug this into the motherboard and this, was, this will allow us to see the consumption from the motherboard before we prompt to boot and after we prompt to boot. And this is very important. Working motherboard should not have any current draw before we prompt to boot. So now we're gonna go ahead and give that a try. We're gonna push power and we get 2.2 amp draw before prompt to boot. That is a bad sign. That tells us there's a short. When you get 2.2 amp draw before prompt to boot, usually there's certain lines that will give you these symptoms. So, it's our, so now it's my job to track down which line is giving us that short uh, behavior. Because a working motherboard should have zero and it should only draw current when we tell it to, when we prompt to boot, which is this button here. So let's go ahead and check out the motherboard under the microscope. All right, so now that we've found that there's a problem, one of the first things I like to do is do a visual inspection to see if there's any signs of like water damage or like burned chips or cracked chips or anything like that. From my visual inspection so far, nothing stands out as being a problem. Now, if you never looked at our motherboard, then it's gonna be hard for you to know what's bad and what's good. But, so let's walk through a iPhone 8 board here that looks like there's no signs of water damage. Everything looks factory. I'm actually peeling off these stickers so we can see under them because oftentimes there's stuff underneath that gets blocked and we cannot see through stuff. So you gotta peel it off to get a closer look. But yeah, all this looks normal. Actually, you can tell it also hasn't been tampered with. So nobody else has been working on it. So that's always a good sign as well. I, when someone else tries motherboard stuff to a phone and 
especially if you could tell it's a simple issue, but they couldn't figure it out, you know it's gonna be bad news if they tried soldering when the issue could have been easily solved. So everything looks clean and good and no visual cues as to where the problem is. So now let's find uh, the main, let's check the main lines that are most commonly to short and give us that 2.2 amp draw before we prompt to boot. All right, so this is ZXW, it's a board view software that allows us to see the layout of the board, lets us see the net names, so we can see the names of each line, and then when you click on them, you can see what connects to what, and with this, allows us to diagnose this issue further. So the most common line that will short to ground when you have a current draw before you prompt to boot, uh, there's three main lines on iPhone 8. Uh, one is bat BCC, which is basically the battery connector. Um, you know, it makes sense. We're connected to the battery connector and we're getting current draw. So this line could be the culprit. So if we just check this under the microscope, you can see, is it shorted? So on my multimeter, I have it set to diode mode. This is what I use 99% of the time when trying to find shorts. Actually, 100% of the time when I'm trying to find a short, I use diode mode. So diode mode on my Fluke 115, which I will also link in the video description. Put your red probe on ground and your black probe on the pins. And look at that, we have a reading of 0 0.403. That is not a short. A short will be 000, like for example, this one. But I'm touching ground, so that's expected. So it's not bat VCC. Next, let's go to another common line on iPhone 8. A very common one is also VDD boost. Now, this one you'll have to find either through experience or use the uh, little bar here at the bottom where you can type in the names. So uh, it's VDD underscore boost. And you click enter, you'll see it pops up. And then when you select it, it'll highlight it. So let's find this part of the board and probe this line to see if it's shorted. So red probe on ground, black probe on the line, and is not shorted, 0 0.383. So not a short on that line. So lastly is kind of where I got my name for the business. It changes starting on iPhone 7 and newer, which is now called VDD main. Originally it's called VCC main. So let's type that in at the bottom. Uh, VDD underscore main. And this is what uh, VDD main looks like. You can actually see it's everywhere on the board. So this is the main power line for the phone. So it powers many different chips and it's very common to short to ground just because of how common it is across the board. So if we go find uh, VDD main somewhere so we can probe it, all right, let's find this cap here. There's a giant cap kind of in the middle of nowhere. And it's the bottom side of this cap. Here it is. So red probe on ground, black probe. We're gonna touch the cap. And look at that. We have a reading of 001002. So a really low reading. So ground is 000. A shorted line, almost 000. So yeah, this is definitely bad. You see we get also long beeps. So we have found the line that's shorted. Now because, just because we measured this cap and it's reading as short doesn't mean this is the shorted component. Everything on this line will read as short. So for example, this cap right here is also VDD main. This cap is VDD main. Everything on this line will read short because we have now, this line has now connected to ground. So everything on the line is connected to ground and we need to find the reason for it. So next step would be to use my thermal camera. So my favorite thermal camera is actually the Seek Compact Pro with macro lens and in my custom sand. So I will link this down in the video description as well. It is perfect for motherboard repairs because it is hands-free to use. It is real quick to set up. So all I do is actually just plug it in to the phone and it starts up and then I can put the motherboard underneath and then we can go through the process. So for you guys to see 
I'm actually gonna record it here on the phone. So uh, the trick here is actually, I'm gonna show you both ways to do it. One is using a DT-80, but the problem with using a DT-80 is that if we use the battery connector to inject voltage into VDD main, it has to get from the battery connector to VDD main somehow, and there's gonna be a chip that lights up with heat when you're doing this. So what's gonna happen is I'm gonna push power. You're gonna see the 2.2 amp draw and we're gonna see heat. Oh, look at that. It's actually not doing it. Oh, you know what? I think because I found the short and it is right next to the MOSFET that usually lights up. So one of the nice things about the stand is we can raise it up so you get a wider field of view. And then once you want to kind of narrow down the fault, you can zoom in by raising it, I mean by lowering it down. All right, so this is a bad example. It's not doing the thing that usually happens where that little MOSFET right there is heating up right here. Usually this thing lights up and you won't be able to notice where the short is. So don't fall for that. I guess this one's a bad example. But if you're not gonna use the DT80 or DC power supply uh, squid connected to the battery connector, another option is to use the DC power supply. So here on the upper left, I am showing you guys my DC power supply. It is set to 4.2 volts and 2.5 amps. 4.2 volts is basically the same as a fully charged battery. So that's why it's set to that. 2.5 amps is roughly the max current the phone will ever draw. So that's kind of uh, the thresholds I set. So for VDD main, this is safe to inject. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna enable it. So now it has zero amps on the screen and we're gonna use uh, the probes. You can see if I short these together, we get 2.5 amp draw and that goes zero. So we're gonna inject directly into VDD main and I'm gonna do that by putting my black probe on ground, so like the Wi-Fi chip, the red probe, I'm gonna inject directly into VDD main. If you guys remember, there was a cap here in the middle with nothing, so black probe on ground, red probe, we're gonna inject, and if you look at my DC power supply, you can see there is, oh, wait, I'm not touching it, there it goes. I am getting the current draw well, let me, there we go. We're getting 1.4 amp draw directly into VD main, although the thermal camera, I'm blocking it. You can see the heat's coming from the right side of the board. So maybe if I scoot this over and put that part of the board in view and inject again, you can see where the heat's coming from. It's coming from this chip here. Now, you can see inject, it lights right up. So let's take a look at that chip to see what does that chip do and how to fix it. So we go back to ZXW. Looking here at the board view, we can see there's a chip here. The name says GSMPA underscore K. So if you just kind of think about it, uh, GSM usually means, you know, like cellular service. PA, you probably wouldn't know this, but PA is probably power amplifier. And K is, I don't know. I noticed a lot of cellular chips will end with the letter K. So, and usually this section is all cellular stuff. Even baseband PMU, which is a power chip for baseband CPU, also ends with K. So definitely a cellular chip. And you can see uh, VDD main connects to it through these caps here. It has another line here. And if we take a look under the microscope, look at that. Actually, there's some kind of black stuff here. So maybe that could have been a clue, although these chips usually look a little funny, so I never really pay attention to that. Yeah, so basically this chip here is causing the short. So our goal is to first remove the short and see if that solves our current draw. We don't need to have, uh, we're not supposed to have any current draw before we prompt the boots. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the board in a board holder and we're gonna start some micro soldering. All right, so one thing to note is this chip has an orientation. Since this is actually gonna be a full fix, 
we need to keep note of the orientation. So what I like to do is the dot goes in this corner. So I'm gonna go ahead and just mark the shield. So when I go back to install the chip, I have an easy way to remember where to, how to orient this chip should face in that direction. So I'm gonna add some flux. I'm gonna put my hot air station to 380 Celsius and 50% air. It's an add-in hot air station, which I will also link down below in the video description. And we're gonna get this chip off, get this short cleared, and see if that does it. In theory, this should be the culprit because obviously we, uh, we saw heat when injecting directly into VDU main. So let's get this chip off. And usually when there's a short on a chip, it takes a little more work to get it off because it's, it's grounded. There's ground connected to it, so the thermal mass is larger and it takes a little more heat to get it off. So we just gotta heat it up. I think it might be coming loose now. Yeah, see it moving. All right, it's gone. So visually, let's check the bottom. Yeah, like visually, you would never know that this chip was shorted. In theory, this is a short. We haven't confirmed it, but high chance this is the culprit. But visually, no signs other than a little brown section here, which these chips look a little like that anyway. So while it's still hot, let's prep this area just because I need to do it anyway. And Doing it while it's hot is the best option. So now I'm using my Action T420D soldering iron station, which also linked down below. I actually have a page on my website where I link to all my tools. So if you wanna get pretty much the same setup I have, check it out. By doing so, you are supporting the channel and will make me create more videos like this. All right, this is ground, I believe. So this requires a lot of heat to flow. All right, let's prep these pins. It's kind of tricky here because it's a very tight spot. I don't want to bump any of the surrounding components. Now, because that center ground pad is very large, we need to flatten it out. So add some more flux. We're gonna use some hot air to suck it up into my wick. This uh, solder wick braid will absorb all this uh, extra solder that's on this pad. All right, so basically just rest it on there. You could kind of press on it a little bit. So the goal is to add my own solder on top of the factory solder so it could be an easier solder job afterwards. The factory solder is much higher temperature threshold to melt. So that's kind of what I'm doing here is trying to flow my own solder on here. I really want to get the pins here on the outside. So when I go to replace this chip, it'll have a good solder pad to land on, so to speak. All right, let's go with that. Now let's clean it up a little bit. All right, so now that we've removed the chip, We've prepped the pads just so that we save ourselves a step later. Now it's time to check, is the short gone? So let's bring up the multimeter and just for easy sake, we're gonna check the exact same cap we checked last time. So red probe. So when you're doing data mode, it's backwards, red probe on ground. So I'm gonna put it here on the Wi-Fi chip, black probe. Look at that. 
VDD main is now reading 0.25 and increasing because it's uh, cooling down. But before we were getting a flat zero, now we're getting not zero. So definitely we've cleared the short. So now, and so at this point, if this was data only and the customer only cared about data, we could pull data from this phone. Uh, we do not need this chip for the phone to turn on. There's a lot of chips that are not needed. I don't have an exact list, although if somebody wants to help comp, you know, put that together and post it on the repair wiki, that, that would be awesome. I'll read you guys the ones I know for sure. So none of these chips are needed to boot. You don't need chestnut to boot, but you do need it to get image. Um, I do think you need these here, the speaker amps. Uh, you don't need hydro to boot, but you need it for USB. Don't need baseband PMU. Don't need audio IC, I don't think. All right, that's, I don't have 100% certainty on some of these. A lot of times just trial and error at the time I'm doing the job. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, keep going. So since we have to replace this chip, we need to get it from somewhere. Now I don't have brand new, but I do have a donor board. So I have an iPhone 8 Plus that just happens to be the exact same uh, phone. Let's see if this is the same chip. Uh, looks like it. So on my iPhone 8, we have, oops, I think this should work. So usually iPhone, like when you have the regular and the plus versions, what Apple does is the exact same design, uh, just mi some minor tweaks to accommodate for the larger screen. So in theory, iPhone 8 and 8 Plus all has the same, has all the same chips. So you can see here, the original shorted one is 77367-1. The iPhone 8 Plus donor board, 77367-2. I think it should work. Maybe that, I don't know if that two would matter, but in my experience, they're all the same chips, so let's give it a try. So let's put some flux, and then the exact same temperatures, we're gonna use 380 degrees Celsius and 50% air on my add-in hot air station. So the trick here is to just heat up the board, we're trying to get the solder to melt under the chip. Oh, it looks like it's coming loose. All right, we got it off. Now this specific chip, I don't think we have a stencil for. So in, our, in order for us to solder this onto the customer board, we can try it as is, because this is more like surface mount type of chip versus, um, it kind of looks like a surface mount chip. It's not a BGA style. Hold on, let me grab a stencil. All right, so I have a giant pile. This is just a portion of my pile of stencils. So I need to find an iPhone 8 stencil. All right, so I got a stencil. It is for iPhone 8. Is there any, is it this one? This one might work. So what I'm gonna do is actually gonna reball this chip so it can make it a little easier for us to install. So let's go through the process of reballing. First, let's verify, this is a oddball chip, so I just wanna make sure this is actually the right stencil. Yeah, look at that. So this lines up. This is the Kianli uh, gold iPhone 8 stencil. Pretty hard to show on camera because it's very reflective. So the first step is prep the pads. Essentially, like before, we wanna replace the solder with our own because the factory solder is no bueno. And we're gonna do it by 
putting some solder on our iron and we're just going to run over all the pads. Now normally I don't wick, but since this one has a giant pad in the middle, I think I might have to. So I'm just going to try to suck up the center pad. And I just want the center section just because that's the most, uh, the thickest part. Then I'm going to use isopropyl alcohol and a toothbrush to clean off all the burnt flux from my iron. And then I'll put it on my little uh, cloth towel thing here. Now you can use a paper towel instead of this. I haven't been able to find uh, replacements for these type of cloths I use, but I highly recommend you use something as your surface. When you're reballing, you want to have a soft surface under. Don't just do it straight on the silicone mat. It's not gonna give you the same same effect. All right. So I have it lined up. I'm using my fingers on the side to hold hold it down. And then you see this paste still good. I just used this the other day, actually yesterday. So I'm gonna go ahead and apply it. This is already paste has been dried out a little bit. You can dry it out by just scooping it up out of the little paste bucket and then pressing it down on the paper towel so it can absorb some of that moisture and it's a little drier. Once you apply it and flatten it out, you can just use your tweezers to hold it down. And then I'm gonna use 330 Celsius and 25% air and essentially kind of just warm up the stencil slowly. You wanna be real patient with this. If you're too quick, you could cause bubbling. You can see how the liquid is kind of oozing out. So our goal is to make sure we form even solder pads or solder balls on this. There it goes, it's forming. There you go. Nice solder joints there. Now we can let go of the stencil and then poke it out. And while it's still hot, clean the stencil so that next time it's clean and ready to go. All right, so this is what the final product looks like. You can see the little solder balls or like little pads, their shape. And the way the stencil is designed is that I only apply the tiny bit of uh, solder paste in the center so that it creates a small enough pad so that it doesn't become a giant pad in the center. Now, if you, you can, at this point, reflow it one more time to create a, there you go, kind of finish the solder job. So you can see the center is not just a giant blob, it is even blob. All right, and that reballed chip is ready to go. Confirm this is the number two, which is the one we pulled from the A+. Plus. I didn't actually grab the wrong chip. I'm gonna put some flux here on the board. All right, that's kind of a lot, but really can't go wrong with too much flux. All right. Try to eyeball the alignment. Now, because this chip is so tiny, I'm just gonna go ahead and use the same 330 Celsius temperature to slowly kind of reflow it into position. All right, I'm just gonna leave it there. The dots is towards this X I scratched out here earlier. It's another important step. You wanna make sure the orientation is correct. And since I added my own solder, which is lower temp, 183 Celsius. It is going to be way easier to install this than it was to remove the original chip. So I'm just slowly heating this up. 
to get it back into the board. Now there it goes, you can see it's moving into position. I'm going to bump it. Oh, there it goes. You can actually see it kind of dancing. All right, I'm trying to bump it, but it's not really doing that. Let me just bump up the temperature instead. So I'm going to 360 Celsius, 40% airflow. You can see how it's kind of dancing in place. That means it has soldered onto the board. So I'm just gonna go ahead and just let it cool down. It's been a few seconds now, so I'm gonna go ahead and drop some ISO. Kind of clean off the remaining flux. It's on the board. All right, so in theory, we should have a fully fixed phone now. So let's, uh, let's check again one last time to make sure we didn't create a new short on the motherboard. Multimeter in diode mode. I'm gonna check that exact same line. And look at that, we have 0 0.278 or 2.80. Slowly climbing, once it reaches room temperature, it will be the normal reading. And yeah, it's definitely a warm board. So now that we've technically fixed it all, we gotta go in reverse now. So if you remember all the tests we did before I did any soldering, the most recent ones I did was the DT880. So we're gonna plug this back in and see if, uh, and see what behavior we get. We're gonna push power. Oh, look at that, we still have a short. It is not normal. All right, so time to investigate a little further. <laughs> I wonder if the, could be under the chip. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing as last time, but this time I'm just gonna use the DT880. All right, so let's take a look at the motherboard. Oh, look at that. The chip itself has a short. You can see there's some heat coming from that area. So let's pull this chip and investigate further. Actually, I'm gonna test with the chip off and see if I still get that same current draw. I wonder if the chip got damaged in the reball process. So this is unfortunate. Um, I may have to go find another donor board. But yeah, I'm still using the same temperature, 360 and 40% air. Also a trick to, to these if you want to check if maybe something bridged underneath is to pull it straight up. That didn't work. I think I pulled it too late. And see if any of the pads are bridged, but I think I refloated it too much. Yeah, actually looking closer at this, that's a lot of solder on each pad. So I wonder what happened. I wonder if I just bridged underneath. Bridge meaning two pads touched underneath the chip uh, when they weren't supposed to. All right, remove the chip. Let's check on the DT-80. See, do we have the same current draw before prompt boots? The answer is no. So that's normal. Although that chip is removed, so whatever that chip does is not gonna function, but if it's prompt boots, that looks like a normal boot up sequence or boot up consumption here in the amps. So yeah, definitely that chip is causing the short. Although the reason could be either the chip itself is bad or a bad install. 
All right, before I install a chip, let's diode mode these pads. If we go back over here. All right, so on the right side, we have ZXW. On the left side, we have the actual board. Now, though ZXW doesn't have uh, diode mode readings, I can still check. Yellow pads should not be ground, basically, unless it's some RF line. All right, not shorted. The blue is always gonna be OL. Uh, VDD main, I don't know what these are, but we're getting non-shorted readings. OL means nothing. Oops, did I touch the shield? All right, this one read as short, so let's investigate. All right, so these usually the ones that say like 50 underscore or something, uh, these are usually antenna lines and they usually have a really low reading so I don't read as short so I think that one's fine Let's check the rest Not shorted and there's gonna be a few ground pads so ground 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 and VDD main and then it's hard to reach I'm gonna rotate it. It's gonna be ground, ground, and reading. So yeah, there's definitely no shorts uh, that I know of. Although this one gives a reading. Where does this go? All right, hold on. What are the chances this is a short? Let me compare that to this iPhone 8 Plus. Now I don't know if this 8 Plus is any good, but at least I have a potential. Yeah, this one reads short. This one does that. Yeah, so I think that should be normal. I think I'm gonna try this chip one more time and see what happens. Otherwise we have to grab another donor board just as I thought I had an easy fix, it turns out it's not. You know what? I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna wick off the center pad. Maybe it's just too too large of a solder joint for this situation here. The same as before, just Hold the wick on the pad and heat the wick and the pad at the same time. Try to get most of the hot air on the wick itself. That'll work really well to suck up the solder here. All right, we got some brown flux in there, so let's clean that off. We don't want to leave burnt flux on the board or on the pads we're going to solder on because then it won't solder on well. On this side, there's still some solder in the center pad, so we'll just leave it as is. It hopes that uh, it's minimal enough that it won't matter. And then let's put this back. Let's see if I can get this installed as is. All right, so I think I have it lined up. I, it feels like the pads on the chip are standing on top, on top of the pads of the board. If so, it should just drop straight down. Like the two pads should join together as one pad. And I'm using the same 360 temperature. Oh, there goes. So I dance, let's wait it out.
Now I do highly recommend these uh, foam swabs. They work really well, especially for motherboard repairs. It leaves zero lint and very absorbent. So you can clean boards like this really easily. All right. All right, please, let's make this work. All right, one more time, let's go ahead and test this out. Do we have a short before prompt to boot? And we don't. Great. So yeah, it was a bad placement the first try. Let's prompt to boot. Normal boot up sequence. So this looks like it's booting up. So what I have like to do at this point is connect the screen as is just to kind of save ourselves a little bit of time in case it's not working. So screen, home button, and that's it. So DT880 plugged into charging port and battery, screen and home button are plugged in. That's all we need just to do the initial kind of boot up. So we're gonna prompt the boots and just monitor the current draw. Get used, if you're gonna be doing this for a living, get used to learning how to read this. And you wanna hold the prompt to boot button, by the way. So you get used to this reading because this will tell you, you don't need to have the phone on to even know if it's booting. So kind of like I did, I did before I put the screen, I already knew it was booting and sure enough, it is. Yeah, there you go. We have a working phone so far. Let me go ahead and unlock it. So yeah, this thing seems to be working. So let's reassemble it and try it again. All right, so I have it pretty much fully assembled, everything plugged in. And if you remember in the very beginning, we tested with the USB meter and we're gonna go ahead and plug it in and take a look at the difference. Remember it was stuck at 0 0.007 and now we have booting is now slowly climbing to pretty much one amp. Now to be fair, I do have this plugged into a really uh, cheap charger. So it's not gonna pull the full current. So yeah, you can see it's turning on and it's working. So one more thing is since we did touch the cellular function of the phone, uh, the chips, you know, one of the chips was the GSM PA. So I'm gonna just plop in a SIM card and see if it picks up signal. So we're now searching. Let's hope it works. So it's still searching. All right, so let me do, let me check something really quick. All right, so after I unlocked it and uh, put it in airplane mode and put it back, you can actually see it's now picking up T-Mobile LTE signal with three bars, which is pretty good in this area. So uh, this is a fully fixed phone and customer's data is still in the phone. So we can just plug this into the computer, run an iTunes backup and secure the customer's data. So I'll, I'll take care of that off screen, but at least you guys can see kind of the process of repairing this phone. So one thing I do wanna mention is that just because in my video here, in this case, we saw that shorted chip and that was the solution, that might not be the case for your scenario. So keep that in mind. This video is, is to show you kind of one scenario of a no power situation. In your situation, you might have a shorted capacitor or you might have something else. You might have water damage. You might have a cracked PMIC. So it could be many different things, but at least you kind of see the thought process on how to deal with the no power. You know, use the DT880 to see the power consumption, use a thermal camera to try to track it down. So hopefully you guys learned something let me know down below in the comments what you found helpful in this video. Even if you just made it here to the end, I'd like to know who's watching the full videos. So appreciate all you guys. Check out the links down below. If you wanna reach out to me for a quote, I have that down there. If you wanna buy a t-shirt to support the channel, if you wanna join my Locals community where I post regularly about the different repairs I'm working on. If you wanna check out the Repair Wiki where we have a bunch of repair solutions. Check all that out. It will be linked down below as well as the tools I used in this video. If you want to see another repair video where I fixed the no power, I'll post it right here. So thanks a lot. I'll see you guys in the next one.